Thank you again for inviting me to be part of the virtual Ezra 2021 Congress. I'm honored to be here uh, representing my facility, um, Stanford University School of Medicine, um, as well as the California Society of Anesthesiologists, American Society of Anesthesiologists, and the American Society of Regional Anesthesia and Pain Medicine. So I'm here to talk about the recommendations and resources for regional anesthesia fellowships. And of course, since based on what I just said, um, since I'm be representing a, a more of a North American opinion, um, I'll be talking a little bit about some of the recommendations that we have gone through in terms of fellowship training um, within, particularly within the United States, and then discuss some of the resources that I think are a little bit more generally available worldwide. I have no financial disclosures. And I think I just wanted to start out talking a little bit about the history of fellowship training in regional anesthesia. And I think this concept um, that we all ascribe to as far as expertise, I think is really best described by Malcolm Gladwell. And he talks about this concept of the 10,000 hours rule. And basically it goes like this. If you have any form of cognitive complex field, it could be surgery, chess, in our case, uh, regional anesthesia, then this incredibly consistent pattern exists that you cannot be good at it unless you've practiced for 10,000 hours, which is roughly 10 years, according to Mr. Gladwell. And I think this idea that repetition is key and dedicated time and training and effort um, can be critical components of training is really how the subspecialty of regional anesthesia has grown from really a core part of anesthesia training you know, to a much better defined subspecialty. And I think we've seen this, um, especially for those of us who've been in practice for a number of years, we've seen this develop fairly quickly over the course of our careers already. If we look at the history and evolution of regional anesthesia training, at least within the United States, um, we've seen it go from regional anesthesia, which is really you know, that portion of anesthesia that's dedicated to selective anesthesia and pain management, uh, to a much broader field of acute pain medicine, which is now incorporated into the official name of the fellowship training, at least for um, accredited fellowships in the United States, which are accredited by the Accreditation Council of Graduate Medical Education. Um, and if you scan the QR code, that'll take you to a history article that we wrote with a number of our colleagues and friends um, to really detail some of the, some of the history um, before much of that uh, institutional knowledge gets lost. And this is really the basis, um, yeah, or at least the basis of this particular article was really a survey of a number of fellowship directors, you know, some of the more um, well-established programs you know, to look back at their own histories, um, which sometimes have been partially verbal and partially written Written, to figure out exactly when training started, at least in this, in this fellowship or post-residency era of regional anesthesia specialty, and where it is now. And as you can see from the bottom, you know, this area of subspecialty in regional anesthesia grew fairly quickly from an optional third, third year of specialty training in anesthesia in which you could dedicate a certain portion of that third year of anesthesia training um, you know, after general medicine training and after internship you know, to just learn regional anesthesia to then um, a, a fourth year, which is a separate year after your three years of core anesthesia, anesthesiology training, which, is, uh, which takes place after your medical school years and internship in the United States. And some of the earliest fellowships that we have in the United States uh, really only date back into the 1980s, which is Brigham and Women's Hospital, the Hospital for Special Surgery, Mayo Clinic in Rochester, as well as Virginia Mason Medical Center. Over the years, the fellowship directors group for regional anesthesia in the United States um, has grown in size and in scope. Um, this started only uh, about 20 years ago and has remained a fairly informal group. Um, we meet twice a year, um, once in the fall at the American Society of Anesthesiologists annual meeting, and then in the spring um, at the American Society of Regional Anesthesia and Pain Medicine's annual spring meeting. Um, a number of different um, initiatives have come from this group. And as I mentioned, because it's not a formal group, there are no officers per se, um, but that doesn't stop this group from being, um, you know, from tackling big problems and coming out with initiatives that advance the training in regional anesthesia. And some of the things that this group has come up with, um, even before accreditation, was really a set of standard guidelines, so recommendations for fellowship training that would separate the training of a fellow, an expert in regional anesthesia, from a general anesthesiologist. 
as well as this idea of knowledge sharing, practice sharing, coming up with a, a set of bank of questions and answers that program directors can use in the training of their fellows. Um, and then eventually, you know, we agreed on creating a common application for fellowships to make it easier for applicants, as well as program directors and selection committees to review applications. And then eventually, um, as of 2016, you know, this accreditation process, um, which is a, sets a national standard for what fellowship training in regional anesthesia should look like in the United States. The road to accreditation and this idea that you could standardize training across um, multiple programs um, is not a new one. And you know, we've had accredited residencies and other subspecialty fellowships within anesthesiology established uh, years before regional anesthesia became accredited. Um, but based on the fellowship directors group, and we've had we had numerous conversations over the years as to whether or not we should seek accreditation of the fellowship program. Um, as of 20, 2013, um, our group agreed that we would pursue this idea of accreditation in order to establish a standard. Um, and just for clarification, the accreditation process, at least within the US, is really accreditation of the program. It's not an accreditation of the individual or of the graduate. Um, it creates a set of standards or program requirements that an accredited program has to, has to ad adhere to, uh, to the point where that program can be regularly and should be regularly uh, reviewed by an external auditor uh, from the accreditation council in order to ensure that the program is fulfilling the program requirements and providing the product, which is you know, expert training in regional anesthesia for every fellow that comes through that program. As you can see here, and this was actually many years of my life, um, I headed up this process starting in 2013. This culminated in the creation of a standardized fellowship program requirements document that then was put out for public comment and review, and then was established as you know, the core fellowship uh, program requirements for regional anesthesia subspecialty training as of 2016. And then in that fall, um, around the time of the American Society of Anesthesiologists annual meeting, uh, the application process for the first group of accredited programs opened. And by 2017, we had the first group of nine programs accredited in the United States. Um, and we developed milestones, which were really our competency achievement milestones you know, for fellows who graduate from the program. And you can read a little bit more about this. And you know, my, my friend and mentor, Rick Rosenquist, you know, who is the head of pain management at Cleveland Clinic, um, wrote this article summarizing much of this process. And the reason why um, you know, Rick and I had combined on this article was because when I found myself in 2013, um, you know, in charge of evaluating this process, um, I contacted Rick, who had been a longtime mentor of mine in my career, um, because he had served not only on the residency review committee um, for anesthesiology at ACGME, but he's also an incredible source of just sound advice. And so, um, so we put together a, um, a summary document just to explain how we got from this idea of pursuing accreditation all the way through the accreditation process that could be used as a source document for any other subspecialties within anesthesiology uh, that are interested in going down the same road. So today in 2021, this is as of literally today, um, I checked on the, on the website for ASRA where we post all of our programs. We now have over 90 regional anesthesiology and acute pain medicine fellowship programs in North America, including in the United States and Canada. And that amounts to over 200 fellowship positions uh, within uh, North America. And I think it gives our applicants a number of options as far as you know, where they pursue their fellowship training. And if you go to the ASRA website, you can see the number of programs per state or per province, um, and you can see that they're fairly well spread out. Today, there are 38 ACGME acc accredited programs, and that means that of those over 90 programs in North America, 38 of them today um, are externally reviewed and have already been approved by the Accreditation Council of Graduate Medical Education. That means that these 38 programs are held to the standards, the program of common program requirements for all fellowship programs that have been uh, written and approved as of 2016. And so for all of these programs, when you first become approved, you're only approved uh, for accreditation for two years. So within those two years, that, new, that program has to be externally verified by ACGME 
to uphold the program requirements and to have addressed any citations that were found in the initial application process. So like I said, this is accreditation really pertains to the program itself um, as opposed to the applicants, but it verifies for any applicant or fellow that, or prospective fellow that's interested in training in that program, that this program meets the requirements that have been set forth by a national governing body. Of those programs, as I mentioned before, they, we initially started out with nine programs in 2017. Those nine programs had a two-year initial accreditation. All nine of those programs achieved continuing accreditation status or were passed on for continuing accreditation um, as of that two-year mark. And so currently um, now we have 19 programs that are in continuing accreditation status. And so not only have they gone through the application process to become initially accredited, but they've been externally reviewed at the two-year mark and have been found to continue uh, to be adherent with the program requirements um, and are continue to provide um, training for their fellows you know, that uh, meets our national standard. Now, there's still a lot of work to do, and I bring this up really in terms of resources and training concepts for, uh, for all of us worldwide who are interested in developing expertise um, of our future fellows in regional anesthesia. And I think simulation will always be part of that paradigm. Uh, I think we know from the last year and a half you know, during the COVID pandemic that the ways that we teach and the ways that we learn have had to evolve. Um, and so I think simulation, I think, will be part of this. Um, and we'll have to learn new ways to do simulation, some of which may involve uh, distance simulation, which um, you know, can be feasible, especially with the assistance of video technology. I also think that we can look towards other resources, some of which are available for free. Like this is a great example that's offered at the University of Toronto. Um, it's a virtual reality simulation model. Uh, we may not always be able to you know, have small group cadaver dissection, um, live teaching um, you know, opportunities for our fellows and for our uh, junior faculty and other trainees um, in, in a reliable way um, until while we're still in the middle of this pandemic. And so having other educational tools tools and resources like virtual reality um, and online other online resources, I think is going to be very important for the future of fellowship training programs, uh, as well as our trainees that we're trying to teach today. I think other areas for improvement for us and things that we may want to invest in in terms of resources are perhaps more objective measures of achievement. And you know, this is a great example of a study performed at University of Toronto evaluating uh, technology that's been used in surgical training programs this is hand motion analysis. Um, and the findings from this study I thought were very interesting and very relevant to training programs that are looking at competency based learning. Um, so not just logging in a certain number of procedures or logging in a certain number of days um, or, or weeks of training, but saying, well, we want to have a measurable um, achievement point to then say that you've uh, developed competence um, in a particular um, technical skill. And in this case, uh, looking at hand motion analysis, um, if you compare novices versus experts, experts tend to have much more conservation of motion. And so they have less motion and that can be measurable using objective tools like this. And at our facility, we've explored uh, this idea of using eye tracking. Eye tracking technology is not new. It's used in other industries like advertising and web design, um, because if, as you can imagine, you wanna know where your customer is going to look. Um, and that helps you design uh, visual interfaces, whether they be ads or websites. Um, for us in ultrasound guided regional anesthesia, our practice is also extremely visual. And so the concept of using eye tracking to actually measure you know, where, not only where the user is looking, but also how quickly that person can identify a target and also how, how uh, many or many gaze fixations or the proportion of gaze fixations that a user can concentrate on an area of interest also helps us understand you know, how that user or learner can master a particular skill. And so you know, just looking um, even qualitatively from frame A to frame B, you can see that you know, these two practitioners have very different levels of experience you know, with this particular ultrasound guided procedure, which happens to be a simulated pair vertebral block on a model. I also think it's important that we look at resources like tools. So in this case, you know, one of the projects that we worked on, at least conceptual projects, was a pragmatic approach to evaluating new techniques. 
Uh, what we teach our fellows today uh, is not what they're going to be practicing for the rest of their career. And I think we all know this. Um, I mean, I, for one, did not learn ultrasound for regional anesthesia as a trainee. I had to learn ultrasound after my training was over. Um, and even in the time, even in the time that uh, I've been training fellows, we've seen um, an explosion of new block techniques, you know, in particular, a new fascial block, um, fascial plane block techniques um, with the advent of ultrasound. And so really training our fellows who are going to be the future experts in whatever practice that they join, how to best evaluate new blocks is going to be really critical, not just for advancing the specialty of regional anesthesia, but also advancing patient care. And a crude way to look at this is that if you had a scale in which you could compare one block versus another block, maybe it's the incumbent block or the gold standard block uh, compared to a new block. Uh, for example, if you're trying to expand regional anesthesia availability for your patients having chest wall surgery and the gold standard is paravertebral block, you know, how would you compare that paravertebral block to say a newcomer like a rector spinae plane block? Um, Sometimes you know, we have very emotional responses to these questions, but I think if you were to take a pragmatic approach and you looked at those four categories, looking at efficiency of practice, looking at increasing access, improving outcomes or comparing outcomes uh, based on different techniques, and then also looking at dis decreasing disparities of care, which I think many of us have, um, you know, have really concentrated our attention on in recent years, then I think that you would be able to look at you know, those, those new techniques more, much more objectively. And so for every practice, and this is very practice dependent, I recommend assigning a certain number of points in each of these categories, and then try to objectively evaluate a new block versus an established block or protocol um, using that same point system. And as I mentioned, it'll be different for every group and every practice. Because when we look at the number of blocks, as I mentioned already, uh, we are going to continue to see more. And you know, when we wrote this editorial uh, for anesthesia for a special issue dedicated to regional anesthesia, um, it was striking how many new blocks uh, that have the words plain block in them have been described just in the last few years. Um, and that's only going up. And I think that it's important for us to recognize this if we're going to prepare our fellows for future practice. And there are so many different options. And I do think, um, I, I first, I thank my friend, um, Dr. Amit Pawa for this incredible figure. Um, yeah, and, and for really, um, yeah, for really showing in one frame just how complex regional anesthesia and analgesia has become, because there are so many no more blocks today than there used to be. And sometimes the decision as to what's most appropriate or what's important to learn for the general anesthesiologist is not always easy. I think when we um, consider how we continue to learn, I think we have to consider the resources available online. Um, social media is a powerful tool. Um, yeah, I'm very active um, and I can honestly say that I've learned so much from my use of social media and Twitter in particular. If you look at different platforms, at least in survey of, the, of Americans, we see that YouTube is number one followed by Facebook. And then there's a, a collapse, or at least there's a conglomeration of multiple different platforms after that, which is really very preference-based. I started using Twitter in 2013, and I've been fairly dedicated to its use now ever since. Um, I would argue that you know, this is really a great sharing platform for new knowledge. And I know, you know during the COVID pandemic in particular, uh, many of us got a lot of our information related to COVID-19, as well as our, our areas of medical specialty, um, learning about PPE and new protocols, and then uh, keeping up with what's new in anesthesia and regional anesthesia, also through Twitter. If you're interested in getting started, this is more than I wanted to cover in this particular talk, but I would just uh, send you to this particular reference page. Um, I put in some links. Um, this is on, hosted on my website. Um, if you're interested in just getting started on social media, if you aren't already, um, there are some tips and tricks, some reference articles on how to set up a professional Twitter account, as well as choosing the right platform for you. Um, there are also a couple of links that may uh, give you some resources for creating content um, of your own, uh, whether it be uh, creating graphics or finding um, you know, free sources 
of images that you may want to use, at least in posts or even in presentations. And so I'll send that to you there. Um, if you have any questions about any of this, of course, um, please do feel free to contact me. Um, I'm fairly easy to reach um, and find, as uh, many of you already know. And so with that, I'll go ahead and stop sharing. And I again want to thank you very much for the opportunity to be part of the virtual 2021 Ezra Congress. And I wish you a great rest of the meeting.